Few issues have so divided and polarized entire peoples more than the fierce debate over the validity of Charles Darwin's theory of evolution and its place in society. Christianity's reactions have varied, ranging from the fundamentalist evangelical reactions to the less defensive Anglican and Catholic responses. Charles Darwin, born 1809 in Shrewsbury, England, originally intended on becoming a surgeon but quickly abandoned this pursuit to become a member of the clergy. However, Darwin's affinity for biology led him to drop his study in ministry and study the natural sciences at Edinburgh University, where he received his bachelor's degree in 1831. Voyaging on the HMS Beagle, the young naturalist made observations and connections that allowed him to develop his theories stated later in his most notable work, On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. His primary hypothesis was that organisms evolved and adapted over time. A non-confrontational man, Darwin's intent was not to discredit the biblical story of creation. Instead, he was merely providing what he felt was a valid biological finding. I suspect that the, the, the people who really got it were the biologists at the time. I, don't, I wouldn't say that he played up the ways in which it was, um, in which there was some great break between uh, his ideas and, and Christian ideas. Although opposition existed, the initial Anglican reaction was mild. Being that a number of Anglican priests were scientists as well as theologians, Darwin's theories were analyzed and confirmed to the standards of the day. The Anglican priest did not find an issue with his findings as they stood. However, within the following decades, opposition rose against the implications that Darwin's theory raised in relation to biblical skepticism. Not only did Darwin's theory call into question the literalism of the seven-day creation, but it also raised the question of how man was created. Things came to a head when the British Association for the Advancement of Science opened a debate between two of the most prominent figures on the issue. Thomas Huxley, a supporter of Darwin's theories, fervently debated Bishop Samuel Wilberforce, a biblical apologist. Wilberforce attacked evolution not on the basis of scientific theory or lack of genetic evidence, but instead focused on how Darwin's ideas were not compatible with an exact description of Genesis chapter 1. At the end of the debate, Wilberforce famously asked Huxley if he was related to an ape on his grandmother or grandfather's side. Huxley reportedly returned the jab by saying that he would rather be related to an ape than have an intelligent mind and obscure the truth. The Catholic response to Darwin's theories was quite subtle. Much like the Anglicans, the Vatican had a long history of supporting science, but did have their own issues with evolution. Their issues stem from the fact that natural selection dismisses the concept of original sin, therefore making priests hesitant to adopt the findings. They never specifically condemned Darwin's theories until the turn of the century, even then saying only that original sin had to be figured into any conception of the origin of life. By 1957, the Catholics had changed their stance to some degree. Pope Pius XII issued a decree entitled Humani Generis, discouraging Catholic belief in evolution, believing that evolution was tied to atheism, materialism, and nihilism. Those who feared the new wave of radicalism sweeping the nation favored the Pope's proclamation. More recently, the Catholic Church has begun to support evolution. In fact, in 1996, Pope John Paul II issued a statement saying, Fresh knowledge leads to recognition of the theory of evolution is more than just a hypothesis. The calm before the storm was ending as the 20s rolled around. Major societal shifts divided the population and traditionalists feared that modernization was going to bring their way of life to an end. In America, an influx of European immigrants made their way through the borders and into American society. However, these new immigrants were not met with open arms by the Protestant population, for they were different from previous immigrants. Increased immigration, which brought in people who did not share that religious background, many Jews, uh, uh, Greeks, Italians, who were either Catholic, Orthodox, or in the case of the Jews who were coming, Russian, and often a number of those were atheists. The growth of fundamentalism and people who call themselves fundamentalists were in response to what were called modernists and to modern to modernity and to modernism. Hostility towards groups that were considered outsiders increased tensions. Quotas in 1927 shut off Catholic immigration and the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 led to the fears of communist permeation within the government. Radical political ideologies coming out of the European world, including anarchy, struck fear that created an increasingly nativist perspective. It was during the 20s that the KKK reached the peak of its membership. Though it is now seen as the destructive force of society, at the time it was considered mainstream. Marches in Washington and public displays of racism were commonplace occurrences. To understand the push for conservatism, it is important to examine the climate of the time. After all, the Roaring Twenties earned its name in full. Traditional morals were challenged and new ways of thinking emerged. Widespread relocation from rural to urban areas heavily introduced more modernist thinking. 
In 1922 alone, 2 million people left farms for city and towns. Automobiles and telephones increased the speed of communication, and all of this change was seen by many as abandoning religion in favor of a faster-paced life. In response to these breaks from the norm, conservative voices were raised in opposition. In 1919, the sale of alcohol was banned in the U.S. The same people who lobbied for prohibition were also involved in school reform. The school system was in the process of a major overhaul, an overhaul that was partially assisted by Christian evangelicals who supported reform on the premise that such schools would teach Christianity in the classroom. Traditionalists and modernists clashed over the role of family in education. Conflicts arose when the other reformers, mainly northern, more liberal teachers, pushed for science in the classroom rather than scripture. These conflicts were a major issue because schooling nationwide was now mandatory. One of the most memorable events in the midst of the struggle, the Scopes Monkey Trial, occurred in 1925. In Dayton, Tennessee, a biology teacher and football coach challenged the standing law on teaching evolution in school, that is, it was not to be done. John Scopes was arrested and pleaded not guilty by reason of the law being unconstitutional. He was represented by Clarence Darrow, an ardent anti-fundamentalist, and prosecuted by William Jennings Bryan, a former presidential candidate and deeply religious Christian fundamentalist. The Scopes trial was the first to be played out over the national airwaves, touching millions of homes across the nation. Scientists were called up to defend evolution's principles and tenets, which now the genetics were being explored, was gaining validity. Darrow realized that, with such extensive coverage, he could lose the case in Tennessee, but still had the opportunity to win the minds of Americans by presenting the case as one of good science. Following an intense eight-day trial, nationwide resistance to evolution weakened. However, Scopes was found guilty of breaking the law by teaching evolution. Despite the legal ruling, this ideological victory, coupled with the death of William Jennings Bryan, dampened the debate for the next 30 years until the tensions were once again revived by a new generation. With the turbulent 1960s came the revival of anti-evolutionary creationism by fundamentalists. Just as the evangelicals fought to block evolution and modernization in the 20s, traditionalists of this period came out to defend their traditional values. The standoff with the Communist Soviet Union throughout the 1950s led to a revision of the United States' role as a contributing member to science, attempting to regain the position at the forefront of innovation. The National Science Foundation decided to change the science curriculum in schools following the Soviet launch of Sputnik. However, the Biological Science Curriculum Study, published in 1960, led to opposition from fundamentalists who felt the Bible still had a place in public education. For example, the curriculum formulated at the University of Colorado Boulder was centered around Darwin's theory of evolution and planned a new biology course for upper levels of high school biology. The battle between science and religion was again coming into focus. More creationist literature was released between 1960 and 1970 than had been published in the previous 30 years. The Genesis Flood, the biblical record and its scientific implications, written by Henry Morris, an engineer and professor, and John C. Whitcomb, an Old Testament scholar, sold tens of thousands of copies and became a source for reason for creationists for the remainder of the century. Arguing that the Bible was historically and scientifically accurate, they wrote that the world was created in six days and that fossils were all from the last 6,000 years, with humans and dinosaurs coexisting at one point. Rather than fading away in a manner similar to the 1920s, the fundamentalism of the 60s carried into the 21st century. Unlike previous religious objections to science, Fundamentalist evangelicals have taken the lead previously held by the Catholic Church. The hotly contested debate over the place of evolution in public schools was played out in 2005 by school boards in Pennsylvania and Kansas, and in Texas in 2010. However, no clear resolution has been made as to the place of the theories in the classroom. The clash between science and religion predates the Darwin Dilemma, or the reaction of faith to Darwin's findings harking back to the time when church leaders denounced Galileo and Copernicus as heretics. It is now universally accepted that the theories of these two men are correct. The science was proven to be true, but faith remained intact. Darwin's theory of evolution is a theory and will remain simply that until the missing links of information are filled in with more concrete evidence. The Darwin dilemma endures without a conclusion because it is still in the midst of its development. Charles Darwin phrased it best in his work that initiated the strife. It is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent. It is the one that is most adaptable to change. <laughs>